to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the scripture says that holy men of god spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. Welcome to our study of the truth about inspiration and authority. I'm Ben Bailey, and as always, our lessons are brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. We encourage our listeners to watch our program and to visit the Church of Christ in their area where they'll find loving members of the Lord's body who are concerned about the truth of God's Word and your soul as well. And as always, we want you to visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a host of free Bible study materials that you can access online or you can write to us or call us and we'll be glad to send you a DVD or a free CD of today's lesson or any of our lessons. And as always, if you've got a Bible question, something you've been studying about or wondering about or maybe wanting more information in the Word of God on, please write to us, call us, or email us, and we'd be glad to help you with that question as well. Today is a second part in our study of the inspiration of Scripture. In our last lesson, we kind of noted why inspiration is important. We looked at some Bible passages that dealt with that. We noted that the nature of God, it demands the Scripture be true. And we looked at Jesus' view Himself of the Scriptures and how He noted they were indeed from God. Today, we put a third aspect with that. Not only did Jesus teach about inspiration, not only does God in His very nature demand inspiration, but the Holy Spirit also is a key ingredient in the inspiration of Scripture. As we begin with, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19-21, through 21, the Scripture says, Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What does it mean that holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit? The word moved in this verse literally means to be born or carried along. Uh, I'll give you an illustration. The Greek word for moved in 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 19-21 through 21 is the same word that is used in Acts 27, verses 15-17. through 17. Let me read that verse for you. And I want you to listen to what the Apostle Paul had to say about his journey, how that the ship was moved, and how there is a similar comparison to that word. Acts 27, beginning in verse 15, says this, So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. And running under the shelter of an island called Claudia, we secured the skiff with difficulty. When they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship, fearing lest they should run aground on Sirtis sands. They struck sail and were driven. We let her drive. It was driven. That's the idea of the word of 2 Peter 1, verses 19 through 21. Now, you think about this for just a moment. Notice how the ship was moved, what the role of the sailors were, and how this relates to the role of inspiration of the Scriptures. For example, these experienced sailors could not navigate the ship because the wind was so strong. That ship was being driven, directed, and carried about by the wind. The Bible says we let her drive. We just basically let the boat go and the wind did with it what it wanted, although we played a part in directing that in some sense. A very minimal part was that of the sailors. Now, this is similar to the Spirit being the directing force and the human authors just simply God's tool as the Bible was written. 
This word is a very strong one, and it indicates the, the Spirit's complete guidance, uh, superintendence, overseeing of the human authors. Just as the sailors were active on the ship, though the wind, not the sailors, controlled the ship's movement, so human authors were active in maybe taking up pens, sitting down with paper, but it was the Holy Spirit who oversaw and superintended that process. And so as we think about this idea of the, the Bible saying in 2 Peter 1 verse 21 that the, the Holy Spirit oversaw, that He gave the guidance to the Word of God, you, you can see this idea clearly in Jesus' promise to His disciples. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guided that process and Jesus clearly taught this would be the case. Listen to John chapter 14. And I want you to notice what Jesus said about this in verse number 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in My name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said. What did Jesus promise His disciples? The Holy Spirit's going to take care of this. He's going to teach you all things that would be new information they may not be aware of, new information they needed to reveal. And then a second aspect of that, the Holy Spirit was going to bring to their remembrance things that had happened. And so both new information and things they had seen but maybe weren't sure of, maybe had some, you know, needed to know the full information on, God made sure the Holy Spirit oversaw that process and the end result, they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Listen to John chapter 15, verse number 26, in the promise again Jesus makes about the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in verse 26, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will testify of me. Now, you've got this promise, John 14, John 15, and of course that occurs in Acts 2. When Peter stood up with the eleven and the Holy Spirit worked through them and they continued with that work as they wrote the New Testament. But the promise was made. He'll testify of me. Who? Peter? The Holy Spirit. He's the one overseeing, guiding that process and the end result is the Word of God, not the Word of men. Now, one of the most encouraging passages in these chapters, John 14, 15, and 16, is the words of Jesus in John 16, verse number 13. Listen to the promise Jesus makes here. Jesus said to His disciples, However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. And so, as we think about this process, when the Spirit of truth comes, He'll guide you, listen to this now, into all truth. He'll not speak on His own authority. Whatever He hears from the Father, He'll speak that and He'll relate it to you. And so the process of inspiration was the complete guidance and control of the Holy Spirit, and the end result is we have all truth, not from men, from the throne of God itself. Now, that's the work of the Holy Spirit in the inspiration of God's inspired Word. But you know, as we think about this book, the Bible, I want us to take just a moment and notice also both the Old Testament and the New Testament claim and teaching about inspiration. There's a wonderful passage in 2 Samuel chapter 23, and I think this is one of the greatest to explain and really show how even the writers of the Old Testament understood they were under the guidance and control of the Holy Spirit. Listen to David's words in 2 Samuel 23, verses 2 and 3. The Spirit, this is David speaking, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and His Word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, the Rock of Israel spoke to me, he who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. 
How did David feel as he wrote the Psalms, as he wrote some of the historical books, as these things work together in inspiration? The Spirit of God spoke by me. David recognized he was only an instrument. He was only a tool in the hand of God. And, and this is kind of the whole idea of inspiration. His Word was on my tongue. That's the idea in the New Testament and Old of inspiration. The Word of God was on their tongue. The rock of Israel said. That's the idea. When David spoke, whose words was it? It was the God of heaven speaking through David and God's Word was the product in the end. Indeed, there are many Old Testament passages that are quoted in the New Testament that are actually said to have the Holy Spirit as their author, even though maybe a, a human prophet like David or someone else may have spoke those words in the Old Testament. Let me give you just a couple of illustrations to show that. One is found in Mark chapter 12, verse number 36. And this is a very familiar passage to many. In verse number 36, listen to these words. Then Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, how is it that the Scriptures say that the Christ is the Son of David? Verse 35, now verse 36. For David himself said, notice this, by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And so here you've got a passage from the Psalms where Christ is quoting from David and the Psalms, and Jesus said, as David said, by the Holy Spirit. David may have said that. Who was the guiding force? Who was directing what was said? The Holy Spirit was. Now, another passage in Acts chapter 1 that also shows what men said, what prophets may have said in the Old Testament, was actually the word and the will of God. Notice Acts chapter 1, verse number 16. The Scripture records, Men and brethren, the Scripture had to be fulfilled, watch this, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas. Again, quoting from the book of Psalms in the Old Testament, but I don't want you to miss that little phrase. The Holy Spirit said as it spoke by the mouth of David. Yes, David's mouth was used, but who did the speaking there? The Holy Spirit. It's His Word, His teaching, His voice that came through even though there was a human instrument that was used there. Now, let me give you just a host of these in maybe the Old Testament to kind of illustrate what we're saying here. A couple of these to mention. For example, Psalm 95 verse 7. The text will say a psalm of David and we will say the psalmist said. Psalm 95 verse 7. Hebrews 3 verse 7 quotes the exact words of Psalm 95 7 which the writer may attribute to David and says this. The Holy Spirit said. Now don't miss this. Psalmist said. Psalm 95 verse 7. Hebrews 3 verse 7. Holy Spirit said. Psalm 45, verse 6, again, the writing of David. The psalmist said, Hebrews 1, verse 8, God said. Are you following the equivalent there? What the psalmist said, New Testament says, the Holy Spirit said. What the psalmist said, New Testament says, God said. Although David may have written that, the Holy Spirit and God are the real author of those words. A couple of other illustrations. Uh, Isaiah 7 verse 14. Great passage about how that the Messiah would be born of a woman, born of a virgin. Matthew, in Matthew 1, 22 and 23, quotes the words of Isaiah 7, 14, written by the prophet Isaiah, and here's what he says. The Lord spoke by the prophet, and then he quotes Isaiah 7, 14. Isaiah wrote it in the book of Isaiah, and yet the Bible says the Lord spoke by the prophet. Another illustration, Hosea 11 verse 1. I will send my son to Egypt. Hosea writes that passage, a very prophetic passage relating to the birth and the persecution of Jesus. And so we've got Hosea, the prophet, in Hosea 11 1, writing this verse. Matthew chapter 2 verse 1 says this. 
the Lord spoke by the prophet. Again, God, the Lord, was the author, the driving force behind the words in the Old Testament. Here's another illustration that I think shows this in a very beautiful way. Job 5, verse 13. We have one of Job's friends, Eliphaz, speaking certain words. Now, those words, those exact words that Eliphaz spoke in that narrative between himself and Job are, are, are quoted, are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9, and the Bible says they are God's words. People who spoke in the Bible. People who spoke on behalf of God. How were their words viewed? Not their words. God's Word. Again, Psalm 41 verse 9. David said, Acts 1 verse 16, the Holy Spirit spoke by the mouth of David. Psalm chapter 2 verses 1 and 2. David said, and yet in Acts 4 verses 24 and 25, God by the mouth of David said. Isaiah said, Isaiah 6 verses 9 and 10. And yet the Holy Spirit through Isaiah said to our fathers, Acts chapter 28, verse number 25. Now that we've seen what the Old Testament teaches about inspiration and how some of the writers of the New Testament attribute that to God, let's take just a moment and really focus in on the New Testament and some teaching in it about the inspiration of Scripture. Now remember, Jesus promised His followers that the work of the Holy Spirit would be to provide an accurate recounting of the events of His life. John 14, 26, when the Spirit, the Helper comes, He will teach you all things and He will remember or remind you of things that happened. And because of this truth, and because the Holy Spirit, not men, not history writers, not Josephus or anybody else, because the Holy Spirit oversaw this process, we can have full confidence in the words of the New Testament. In fact, the Holy Spirit, from beginning to end, oversaw, guided, and superintended the process. Let's take a moment to really look into detail at this doctrine in the New Testament. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I want you to notice the words of verse number 16. This is a great passage about inspiration and it really helps us to understand the process itself. The Bible says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, when Paul said, all Scripture is inspired of God. What did he mean by that? Well, inspiration in that text is a very, very unique word. It is a compound word from two original Greek words. The word theos for God and the word penoustos, which literally means to breathe. But not just to breathe, it is the word for exhale. And so you've got a compound word. God exhale. That's the idea. When the Bible says the Scriptures are inspired of God, it literally means that the Scriptures were exhaled out by God. When God breathed out on His breath were the very words of Scripture. But now, let's think about this. What's meant by Scripture? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Are we talking about Scripture in the sense of just the Old Testament? Are we talking about just the New Testament? Or is it a combination of both? And friend, the latter is the truth on the matter. We can know that phrase Scripture refers to both the Old Testament and the New. Romans 15, 4. The things that were written before time were writ for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might find hope. Now, that text, no doubt is using the word Scripture for the things written before time, things written under the Old Testament, not necessarily New Testament writing. And yet, the Apostle Paul had already described, has already described the, a specific New Testament book as Scripture in his first letter to Timothy. I want to direct your attention to 1 Timothy chapter 5, and I want you to notice how Paul uses the word Scripture to refer to 
New Testament books just as much as old. 1 Timothy chapter 5, listen to verse number 18. The Bible says, For the Scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. First quotation. And the second, And the laborer is worthy of his wages. Now, as you think about this, this word here for Scripture, you've got two Old Testament passages being quoted. You've got two usages occurring here. The first in 1 Timothy 5 verse 18 is a quote from Deuteronomy 25 verse 4. The Scripture says, then he quotes Deuteronomy 25 verse 4. You shall not muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain. Meaning, if you're working in a field and the ox is working there with you, don't keep it from eating. It's working, it has the right to eat. A quotation from the Old Testament as Scripture. Now, what about that second passage? The laborer is worthy of his wages. That's not an Old Testament passage. Where does that come from? Luke chapter 10, verse number 7, quoting from the teaching of Jesus, Paul not only attributes Deuteronomy 25, 4 as Scripture, he also notes that the teaching of Luke books of the New Testament were also considered Scripture. And so when we hear that word, all Scripture, we're not just talking about Old Testament. Paul taught us, Jesus taught us, that referred to New Testament teaching as well. Now, there's another passage that also teaches this and shows that the epistles would be included in Scripture as well. The Apostle Peter uses this same Greek word for Scripture to describe the writings of Paul. 2 Peter 3, verse 16, there are some things that certain people are untaught and unlearned as they twist the Scriptures, as they do to our beloved brother Paul, he will say, in some of his writings. And so Paul's writings, which Paul, having writ, written at least half the New Testament, been the human scribe behind half the New Testament, his words were considered Scripture as well. And so is the New Testament a part of that? Absolutely. By the time of the writing of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16, that part of the New Testament was also considered Scripture. And so what do we know about the Bible as a whole in its te teaching on inspiration and the New Testament? Let me offer two or three passages that really help us to understand God's view of the Scripture, what ought to be our view of Scripture in totality. The first is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 13. I want you to notice 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 13 with us as we think about how does God want me? How does He want you to view the Scriptures? Notice chapter 2, verse 13. Paul says, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. How do I view the Bible? Listen very carefully. This book is not in words which man's wisdom teaches. These are not men's ideas. These are not the writings of wise men and their recording of human writing. That's not what it is. Not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but, don't miss this, which the Holy Spirit teaches. Who is the author? Whose words are these? Whose teachings are these? These are the teachings of the Holy Spirit of God straight from the throne of God itself. A another passage that helps us with this is 1 Corinthians 14. And I want you to notice the words of verse number 37. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. The Apostle Paul said, If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things which I write to you. Listen, they are the commandments of the Lord. Somebody says, well, someone, what's a spiritual? Who's a person who's really in tune with God's Spirit and the teaching of God in the Bible? Paul says, that's a person, first of all, who recognizes what I write. That's not my commandments. 
These are the commandments of God. Friend, listen very carefully. This book that we refer to as the Bible, these are not David's. These are not Solomon's. These are not Luke's. These are not Matthew's. These are not Paul or John's words. These are the commandments of the Lord for each one of us to live by and so that we can have the hope of heaven. Now, one last passage that is so important in our understanding about inspiration. I want you to notice Paul's words to the church in Thessalonica as he speaks about the word of truth. Notice 1 Thessalonians 2, verse number 13. Paul said, For this reason... We also thank God without ceasing because when you received the Word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth, the Word of God which also effectively works in you who believe. Paul commended these people. He said, here's what's great about what you did. When you heard the Word of God from us, Paul said, you did the right thing. You didn't receive it as the Word of men. You received it in truth as it is the Word of God. When I open my Bible and I read its pages, I am reading the words of the very God of heaven who spoke the world and this Bible into existence and it's His words, the words of truth, that I'm going to be accountable to in the last day. And so friend, these lessons are designed to help us see. Let's do away with confusion. Let's not listen to the doubters and the, and the critics. Let's turn to the Bible. Let's see. Is this book really from God? And the answer is a resounding yes. Now, the application is, am I willing to study it? Am I willing to read it? And am I willing to obey the Word of God? Jesus said, it's not everybody that looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there, but he who does the will of our Father in heaven. Friend, we encourage you today, take this book as the Word of God, do what it says so that you can have a home in heaven. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. to God be the glory, and to God be the glory. This is the Gospel of Christ.